20th century Sheffield, the industrial powerhouse behind the might of the British Empire, a Klondike for the needs of modern warfare. In the Great War of 1914-1918, Sheffield cast the big guns and manufactured the shells. Its mills rolled armour plate for the Navy's dreadnoughts, which cruised the oceans of the world, and also for the new land ships, tanks. There was also lighter work. The munitions factories employed women to make shells, and each had a clockwork fuse whose patent was owned by the Germans. Incredibly, through Swiss banks, a one penny royalty was paid to them on each shell manufactured right until 1960, when Lloyd George stopped it. When the war was won, the orders dried up. No more big guns and no more big pay packets for the workers. For Sheffield, there was to be no peace dividend. But there was still some good news. Sheffield's advanced technology was recognized worldwide, and the new rolling mills built by Sheffield workers in the new Soviet Republic were to prove inestimable in their value to the Red Army in World War II. Back home, the city initiated much needed public health schemes and celebrated the centenary of its now modern Royal Hospital. The ambitious City Hall enterprise became one of the jewels in the city's municipal crown. But today's school children pass it by without noticing the battle scars of a previous era. For them, it's the history of their grandmothers and their grandfathers. But in those depressed days before World War II, no works the city embarked upon could counter a slump which was worldwide. Sheffield was a working class city and there was less and less work for that class to do. The poverty the city had endured in the 19th century reasserted itself. The dole queues grew. But Britain remained a powerful nation. The Spithead Naval Review of 1937 was, for the senior service, an opportunity to show off before the new king. But underlying the ceremony was a serious show of British naval strength. In line was HMS Sheffield, a Southampton-class 9,000-ton cruiser built by Vickers Armstrong and launched in July 1936. She was nicknamed Shiny Chef because of her Sheffield-made stainless steel fittings. Soon her guns would be used in earnest. For across the channel in Europe, events which would shake the country out of depression and into another bloody, bitter war had begun. Fascism was on the march. It was that man again. A confident and superior Germany marched into the Rhineland demilitarized since the 1919 Versailles Treaty. France and Poland could have raised the 90 divisions they threatened and stopped Hitler in his tank tracks. They didn't call his bluff. Germany's commanders had secret orders to withdraw if confronted with the slightest resistance. But Hitler's grand plan would not be derailed by political posturing. Peace in our time, declared Chamberlain after Munich. Hitler agreed. After all, he had just taken a piece of Austria and a piece of Czechoslovakia. A piece of Poland proved a little more difficult, with Germany losing 15,000 dead and 30,000 wounded. But the ultimate price would be far greater. War was declared, and barely 25 years after the First World War, a new British expeditionary force set off for France. Among them were Sheffield Territorials and the RAOC. In January, they embarked on the troop ship Larina and sailed to Le Havre. In April, they were joined by Sheffield's Royal Engineer Terriers. It was the phony war, and spirits were unrealistically high as the ill-prepared BEF marched forward to hang out their washing on the Siegfried Line. Meanwhile, back home, with memories of the Luftwaffe's destruction of Guernica in the Spanish Civil War, the evacuation of children from British cities was begun. Sheffield had its own plans to disperse women and children throughout nearby Derbyshire, but this was officially overruled, and destinations such as Leicestershire 
Lincolnshire and South Yorkshire were insisted upon. Within a few weeks, as the anticipated waves of enemy bombers failed to appear, evacuated children drifted back, some on their own initiative. But despite the complacency of some, Sheffield got down to training for what might come. The Women's Voluntary Service formed its Sheffield branch in 1939. Their duties would be to cook food, give out second-hand clothes, and of course, dispense tea. Government action was based on worst scenario predictions. The bomber would always get through, and the civilian populations of British cities would be killed by the thousand. In reality, many thousands more would be injured and suffer from shock or homelessness. For them, there would be little official provision. Before the war was a month old, Sheffield was prepared for a gas attack with decontamination centers and special gas sensitive indicators. Civil defense forces organized gas drills like this one disrupting the city center. Wear your gas mask everywhere, even in bed. In 1938, 38 million gas masks had been distributed. This throughout Britain, but by 1940, few bothered carrying them. But the threat was real. Germany was developing a nerve gas, but perhaps the knowledge that Britain had her own gas bomb stockpiles, secretly augmented by supplies from a neutral America, was sufficient to deter its use. With rearmament, women were once more in demand. Government emergency powers insisted that women be directed into factories, and for the first time, they could be called up for military service, but as non-combatants. As men left the land to join the services, the gap in critical agricultural production was filled by the Women's Land Army. Napoleon's statement that an army marched on its stomach was never more true than in a Britain blockaded by German U-boats. Land around Sheffield, not farmed during the slump, was turned to the production of cereals and vegetables. Harvesting programs were organized so that young women and schoolgirls could be bussed out to outlying farms to pick the crops. For some, it was the furthest from home they'd ever been. Hard manual labor on farms could be tough. But for young city girls, it could also be educational. I went into the, decided I wanted to go into farming and I went out to, to Wentworth, joined the Land Army to train at Wentworth. That's near the Earl of Fitzwilliam's place. She used to take a bottle of milk there every day from the farm. And um, they showed me how to milk, which was milking by hand, which I wasn't very good at. But it was a seven day a week job. And uh, it was very hard work actually at that time. The uniform I thought was quite nice. We had this cream shirt, green tie, and uh, the Land Army badge. And we had the, the trousers, which looked a little bit like knickerbockers, you know, they out and then came into the knee. And then we'd got a, a, a fawn stocking that came up here. And then we had either uh, gum boots or boots, whichever we was doing, or walking out shoes, you know. And the hat was brimmed hat. And we did field work, and we used, if you couldn't ride a bicycle, you'd got to ride one. And we used to ride anything up to 10 mile there and 10 mile back a day on a bike. Well, one particular memory that sticks out with me is this particular time we was in this, on this farmer's field, suddenly we saw the farmer come in and we shouted to him, What's the matter with he was he'd got a cow with him, you see. And we said, What's the matter with the cow? He said, I'm taking it to the bull. Do you want to come and look? So we all we all we all down tools and we watched, you know. But when when he brought the cow back, it was still making this noise, you know. In January 1940, rationing began with sugar, butter and bacon. Gradually, most foodstuffs were rationed with higher allocations for manual workers. The winter of 1940 was one of the worst on record, and fuel shortages caused genuine hardship. Soldiers interrupted their duties to clear railway lines. 
Royal Engineer Sappers from Sheffield dug out trains at Woodhead. Britain was at war, but little appeared to be happening. People were beginning to lose interest, so something had to be done to revive that sense of all pulling together. Lord Beaverbrook, a war minister, had an idea that he thought would convince everybody that they were all making a common sacrifice. So all the iron railings around all the private gardens and public parks in the country were to be cut down for scrap iron. In an act of nationwide vandalism, these products of an old-fashioned technology were burned off, gathered together and dumped, sometimes in the sea. All we're left with are the iron stumps and the lead sockets as here on these stones in College Street. Scrap iron was the last thing we were short of in the Second World War. Hi, brother. That's sabotage. Look what you've done. You can say goodbye to that pair. And that's the end of a good jacket, too. Now let's start again. Give it a good brush. Hang it up. Rub it in well. That's better. Here's another one. Look at her ripping that stocking to pieces. Do it again. You heard me. Do it again. That's the way. Ah, here's another wrecker. You don't believe me. Right, I'll show you. That's what happens if you hang them up wet. Why not lay them out flat and smooth them into shape? If you're careless with your clothes, you're robbing a soldier of his coat, a pilot of his helmet. Let these machines operate full time on essential work. Worth it, isn't it? On the 10th of May 1940, the real war began as Germany's well-armed and by now experienced army and air force launched its blitzkrieg. By the 27th of May, the small and confused BEF was in danger of being cut off in Belgium and France. They were forced to retreat, often without firing a shot, as they were repeatedly outmaneuvered. May the 10th went up when Hitler broke through into the Low Countries and uh, we went up to the Albert Canal through Louvain, which was blasted and all the little towns up there had been blasted and it was a sorry sight to see the people with the luggage and things like that and the little handcarts streaming away from the town. Uh, we got to the Albert Canal and we had to relieve the guards armoured did it. From then on it was retreat down through Brussels and the roads were packed with refugees uh, which hindered us greatly. Uh, in point of fact, we hadn't got the equipment to tackle the Germans. I was in the tank, actually, six-ton tank. Now you've got two machine guns on it against the German 75s. I was with the 18th General Hospital, the Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Services Reserves, and we were called up oh, before Christmas and early in January. We went to ATAP, in, um, just down a little way from Dunkirk, and we were evacuated a few days before Dunkirk, actually. At the time, we were, it was in the middle of the night, we were admitting a convoy of wounded, a uh, train load of them who'd been travelling for days, in dreadful, terrible condition, really, and truly a lot of them were. I mean, they were so exhausted, so tired, all they wanted was a warm bed and something to eat. and. Um, we caught together in the middle of the night and given one hour's notice. The younger ones, the younger members of staff, were given one hour's notice to prepare for evacuation.
Britain stood alone, besieged and under very real threat of invasion. On the streets of Sheffield, what had been once the local defence volunteers were formed into the Home Guard, and together with the Civil Defence Forces and AFS, they rehearsed the defence of their city. These privileged few appear to be quite well equipped. Most units, however, were lucky to get broom handles. St John's Church, it was, the headquarters at that time, at Crooks Muller. It was their church rooms. And we, uh, we went and joined, it was the local defence volunteers. Luck, duck and vanish, as was said in those days. We trained at Tuesday nights, and it was, we took it very seriously, the training, because they were, uh, they were old soldiers from the First World War that, that took us. So there was no messing about like Dad's army. <laughs> then we started getting uh, rifles. So from then on, we started guarding our headquarters every Friday night from then onwards. We did exercises, one to Red Myers up that district, and the enemy did come on that exercise, and it was the guards. And they were in their, uh, their vehicles, and somebody threw, <laughs> somebody threw um, a bag of flour at them, one or two bags of flour, and they didn't like it, and they got out of these vehicles, like, and they... <laughs> And, uh, and things started to get difficult. Well, I retired quietly at that stage. <laughs> Britain was in crisis. Its forces had to be rebuilt, and quickly. But the lessons of the Blitzkrieg had still to be fully learned, and the tactics and equipment left much to be desired. Sheffield's importance in the defence of Britain was confirmed by Winston Churchill during his visit in 1940. His eulogies were later to be dedicated to the few, but without English Steel's 15-ton steam hammer at the Vickers Works, the Hurricanes and Spitfires, which won the Battle of Britain, would quite literally have never got off the ground. It was the only hammer in the United Kingdom which could forge the crankshafts of their powerful Rolls-Royce Merlin engines. Sheffield's contribution to the war effort was more than important. It was crucial. Sheffield waited. Ports in the south and along the east coast had already been bombed, and London had been set ablaze. There were those around who could remember the Zeppelin raid of World War I. This shelter is in what was once Fullwood County Primary School. In shelters like it all over Sheffield, people came in with cushions for comfort and candles for light, and perhaps there might have been a stove. What there was was security and reassurance in all being together to drink tea and eat hastily cut sandwiches. But in the long nights of the Blitz and in sporadic air raids, they were very uncomfortable and cold. But even suffering the discomforts of air raid shelters did not guarantee 100% safety, as the people of Porter Street were to discover. At last the bombers came, at the end of August and in September and October. Seven people were killed and 125 injured. Lighter casualties than many had feared, but these raids were only a reconnaissance. Interestingly, there is a Luftwaffe report of a successful raid on Sheffield on the 15th of September 1940, when Heinkel 111s of K Group 100, stationed at Van, France, claimed to have successfully bombed the city. But there is no corresponding British record of this. Perhaps the decoy fires and dummy factories in Sheffield's surrounding countryside had done their job. Regardless, the Luftwaffe came in earnest at 7pm on the evening of the 12th of December, 1940. Well, it was a normal sort of night. Mum had gone to the Empire to see Henry Hall. I'd gone with my sister, my, I'm sorry, not my sister, my Auntie Annie. And Dad came home from work, and eventually the siren sounded, and we all went into the shelter. My, my sister, Barbara, 
three years older than me, she carried one suitcase full of clean clothes. I carried another suitcase full of clean clothes. But Audrey, my sister Audrey, I don't know what she carried, she might have carried the pot. Not the pot I'm talking about, earlier, but the pot. And Dad came along with the thing Mum normally carried, which was the tin box containing the policies that had to go into the shelter. And we got in the shelter. Of course, Dad was very, very concerned about Mum. Eventually, guns started firing, bombs started dropping, I suppose, and Mum came dashing up the passage between the houses into the shelter. Uh, she had very, very quickly told us that when the sirens had sounded, the, the announcement had been given on the stage, and people could either take shelter at the Empire or come home. Mum and Auntie Annie decided to come home. They were on a tram, and when it got as far as Wood Street, which is where Hillfoot Bridge is, the tram driver didn't want to continue because he said the flashes from his overhead wires could attract aeroplanes. It appears the passengers persuaded him that if he did continue to Wadsley Bridge, to the terminus, his tram would be safer there because it was out of the town centre. And so Mum eventually got home. Dad went in the house to get her something to eat, and then we all came in the shelter and sat there for the night while everything happened. Bombs dropping, anti-aircraft fire, uh, rattling of, of shrapnel on slates, that type of thing, windows being smashed out. And thinking about it, we were very, very fortunate. The nearest bomb to us that actually exploded was on Hawksley Avenue, which is near Hillsborough Park. There was one, I believe, a landmine dropped at the bottom of Via Road at the opposite side of Penstone Road, and it didn't explode. And if it had done, I think all of that area would have been flattened. The next morning, Mother and I were going to work as usual. Needless to say, when we got to the tram lines, uh, there were no, no trams, nothing, no transport whatsoever. So we started walking, I think it's four miles from Hansworth to Sheffield. And we started walking down Hansworth Hill, Staniforth Road, Attercliff Road, and eventually the Wicker Arches. By that time we'd been passing gas mains on fire, people coming towards us with a probably a pram or a little cart with all the worldly goods on, would be bombed out. Um, we got through the wicker arches and found trams in half, bits and pieces, terrible things all over. I can't remember, strange enough, being, being very frightened. I can remember being excited. And somehow, all the family together in this hole in the ground, so safe, so warm, so everything, it didn't seem frightening one little bit. A Luftwaffe pilot, Major Max Brunner, of Luftflotte 2, Flagenkorp 1, Armagestrider 3, flying a Junkers 88, recorded the raid in his personal diary. He died on the Russian front. Wir müssen heute Nacht auf Sheffield stoßen. Einer vom Bodenpersonal sagt, er sei schon dort gewesen. Überall Stahlwerke. Wir starten von Brüssel und bald darauf berichtet der Navigator von Seebrücke und der unter uns liegenden Nordsee. Der Flug verläuft ohne besondere Vorkommnisse. Der Flugingenieur meldet, Fluggeschwindigkeit ist 300 km pro Stunde und die Flughöhe beträgt 4000 Meter. Kein Flakfeuer über dem Festland und jemand meint nervös, die wissen, dass wir kommen. Es gibt Gerüchte, dass Luftwaffenbesatzungen, die abgestürzt sind, vom Mob gelüncht wurden. Das ist der Augenblick, in dem wir an unsere Familien, Frauen und Freundinnen denken. Tod voraus. Ein helles Leuchten am klaren Himmel zeigt uns die Arbeit der ersten Angriffswelle. Ungefähr 50 Kilometer vom Ziel entfernt setzt die automatische Bombardierung ein. 30 Kilometer, 10 Kilometer. Die Bombenklappen öffnen sich. Wir sind über dem Ziel. Unter uns sieht es aus wie in einem Zauberkessel. Blitzende Punkte und hell leuchtender Rauch. Der Himmel ist durch dich kreuzende Suchscheinwerfer erleuchtet 
die uns blendeten, als sie uns erfassten. Unter uns explodieren wirkungslos die Luftabwehrgeschosse. Unsere 1000 Kilogramm gemischte, hochexplosive und leicht entzündbare Ladung werfen wir automatisch nacheinander ab, als jemand sagt, es wird bald Weihnachten sein. It was a Thursday, a traditional payday for many, and under Major Max Gruner's bomber, people were in cinemas, dance halls and in pubs. To be perfectly honest, my guardian angel must have been with me that night, because we we thought the planes was chasing us as we was... This isn't... No exaggeration. As we was running down through the wicker, and the sky was... An, it was really... I, I just cannot describe it, you know. It was absolutely all lit up, you know, and the searchlights was going backwards and forwards and this, that and the other. Well, it was absolutely devastating. We can still see the remnants of the steel bolts and the steel plate used to secure a heavy anti-aircraft gun on this site at Shirecliffe. And around, like the remains of some archaeological site, is its concrete reinforcing. They were initially two anti-aircraft batteries established to defend Sheffield and later on a third was formed. No one was told just how ineffective they were however. In fact, the shells and shrapnel falling onto surrounding houses probably did more damage to them than to the planes they were actually shooting at. There's no record of the anti-aircraft guns in Sheffield having actually shot down any German aircraft, but they helped to keep the planes high and several may have been damaged. Newspaper reports of downed planes were not confirmed. My platoon that I was in was posted to Sheffield to look after the gun sites round about Sheffield to keep them with uh, rations, uh, ammunition or whatever the need be. And I was detailed to uh, to take a load of ammunition to man a lane gun site. Uh, they quickly loaded me up the lorry and uh, off I went and uh, I came down from Genocide to Worsley Bridge, uh, Penniston Road and I got onto Shalesmoor and uh, uh, things were getting a bit warm because there was fires and some cars, one or two I could see that the road was blocked and I couldn't get that way. So the officers wanted to know where I'd been and why. And I said, well, look here. I said, I couldn't make a direct. I've had to make a detour. So he said, oh, well done, son, well done. Uh, but he says, we're practically out of this ammunition. He says, we'll have to have some more. So he said, will you be coming back? I said, well, uh, I'll do my best while. And, uh, off I went back and do a, and I did three loads whilst the, uh, the raid was on and uh, even after the uh, the all clear I was still running loads there because they found out that during the blitz they hadn't held enough ammunition per gun that needed. The Luftwaffe's 500 or so high explosive bombs, parachute mines and thousands of incendiaries fell largely within a two mile radius of the city centre, which was soon a sea of flames. Firemen talked of high winds, sucking them into the centre of an inferno like the draught of some enormous furnace. The bright incandescent light cast shadows like the sun and it was possible to read by its brightness. There were still many old timbered buildings in Sheffield among them the King's Head and the Angel. They were burnt to the ground, as was the Westminster, the Royal Oak, the Three Horseshoes, and a number of others. Still stocked with pre-war goods, the great department stores of John Welsh, Atkinson's, Robert Brothers, Cocaine's and CNA modes added fuels to the fires, as did many other well-known names. Sheffield's pre-war shopping streets around the moor were devastated. For Ernest Macmillan Stevens, a member of the Auxiliary Fire Service, it was a fateful night he has never forgotten. 
all, all the all the machines that we had, they were all terrible improvised things. I mean, the thing that we had was an old uh, Humber Hawk, got the back taken out, the pump put into it, and the horse was laid in the side anyhow. They were all, they were all poor, poor machines. It wasn't until well after the blitz that we got equipped with the reasonable material. When we got down onto Bramall Lane, we saw two or three soldiers laid on their backs with the guns at the side of them, and people shouted to another sergeant, shouted, don't look to them, they're dead, which of course was very, very, very trying at that time. We got a little further down the road, and there were two motor cars over on the sides, two people in each one, and they were, they were dead. And uh, after, a long, after quite a long time, we, the, the bombs were dropping and incendiaries were kept having to turn the water off and get up side the wall to, to try and protect ourselves. And we returned to the station probably half past two, three o'clock, and uh, they sent us straight out again. The uh, machine that went to Norfolk Street, it got hit. The part time I got killed, and my mate, he had his arm off. But the sights that we saw, the craters in St Mary's Road, it was really, really heartbreaking to see all these people dipping into the craters, trying to find their relatives, and that happened for right down St Mary's Road. It was a horrible sight. That. Now, when one went up the moor, <coughs> tram cars were all tipped over, and lines were down, shop windows, and it was a really horrible sight. That. Never, I never want to see anything like that again in my life. On Oldsmere Road, uh, across from the church what we was under, it got blew up, all, all the houses. And uh, obviously we were still in the church cellars that got damaged very severely. And the following morning, Monday morning, was, uh, I recollect, going down Spithill with my mother through the wicker we had to think of fire and a, a blaze and trams was uh, all um, blown up and uh, burnt out, really burnt out they were. And uh, climbing over the water hoses to put the fires out and going up, up through town trying to do some shopping with my mother. As we ran up the moor, there was a Carver Street and there was a, an air raid ward and they said, come on, quick, down here. So, of course, we went down in the cellar and there was about 13 of us all together, quite a number of people who came from um, Rotherham and um, this little, there was a boy, about 14, and his trousers was all ripped and every time he, the bomb dropped, the light would go out and he was sat on this bucket and he kept pulling this bucket over his head. It was so funny. <laughs> The biggest single loss of life in the Sheffield Blitz was here at the Marples Hotel, Fitzalan Square. Pre-war, it had seven stories. On the night of the 12th of December, 1940, it was packed with servicemen and service women and people from the newly built housing estates on the outskirts of the city. A 1,000 pound high explosive bomb crashed through the upper stories and exploded on the ground floor, reducing the pub to rubble. There was carnage. Over 70 people were killed. Half of them were women. Bodies were still being brought out days later. Only seven people got out alive, and they were men. Some of the bodies were never found. So the cellar was filled in, and the site was leveled. These are two of the lucky survivors. When dawn broke, the full extent of the damage to Marples and the city centre could be seen. Cliff was in Scotland at the time and uh, he heard it on the radio, you know, that Sheffield had been blitzed. And he said, uh, oh, he sent a telegram, pack your things and come up straight away, you know, which we went. It was a real ordeal, I'll tell you, getting through the wicker, burnt out trams and there were cars and the, it was awful, the chaos. And there I am trudging along, you know, baby in my arms and me case in my hand. Once or twice people had said, can I give you the lift, which they did. I mean, you got, I don't know, more kindness seemed to be around in them days. I think that is the, the state of things that, you know, when we're in trouble, you, you find your friends and and people seem to be more helpful, you know. 
The building behind me used to be English Steel. Its neighbour across the road is the Wellington Pub. During the Second World War and for the raids on Sheffield, the Germans used two electronic navigation and bomb aiming devices, Exverfahren and Knickerbeam. They involved radio beams being transmitted from occupied France, one from Calais and one from Cherbourg. Luftwaffe planes flew along these radio beams until they crossed. That was the target and their bombs could be automatically released. For the raids on Sheffield, this is where the beams crossed. The foundry workers and the steel workers who drank in the Wellington in wartime Sheffield were the luckiest drinkers alive. For in theory, every bomb dropped on Sheffield was automatically aimed at this pub. Now here comes the $64,000 question. Did the British know the Germans were coming on the 12th? You see, the boffins had broken the German code used to identify targets for the Luftwaffe. They could then, by using newly invented electronic devices, bend the German radio beams to confuse bombers into dropping on the wrong place. The question has to be asked. With British interference, did Jerry do to Sheffield's commercial centre and the moor what he really wanted to do to the far more important industrial centre to the east of the city? Whatever, he came back on the Sunday and tried again, this time making an allowance for the bending of the beams. As a result, the Luftwaffe bombs were much closer to the real target, the industrial installations of Attercliffe, Brightside and Tinsley. We were called out to a place, and it wasn't far from where I lived. I really knew the person. And at this, the Thursday night's plates, they'd gone into a neighbour's shelter, because everybody didn't have their own shelter. And uh, they went into a neighbour's. Well, on the Sunday night, they didn't. And that house alone got a direct hit. And uh, we were sent out, and we had to dig for the... the there was a father, so a father mother and two sons. I think they're about four and seven year old, I'm not sure. We got them all out, but they were dead. Call them cousins, I remember. They called it, and I remember the name. I think he worked at the co-op near us. By Monday the 16th of December, the main job of clearing up had begun, and the full picture of Sheffield's destruction emerged. Over 800 people had been killed or were missing and it took three months before all the dead had been identified and cleared from temporary mortuaries. Nearly 2,000 men, women and children had been seriously injured and wounded. Many were later to die of their injuries. Whole areas of houses were damaged or destroyed and many thousands of citizens were made homeless. The damage done to Sheffield's war machine was extensive, but production was held up for only a few weeks, except in the case of Brown Bailey's, where a massive parachute mine closed the plant for 15 months. From a German point of view, the raids on Sheffield were a failure. Life in Sheffield went on. Doctors and nurses were flying all over. The shutters kept coming down through incendiaries and bombs falling around. The nurses were having to put them up as quick as that they came down. That was horrendous, as it, you know, in itself. And then the, the something seemed the the roof seemed to come in, plaster and and everything about, and they're falling all on the beds. And the nurse, they got all the other patients down into the cellars, and they left me because I naturally I'd gone into labour. And when the ceiling started coming down, one of the nurses just threw herself on top of me. And then the next thing I knew, I was pushed off the bed, underneath the bed, uh, for them to work on there. They got the torches and things underneath the bed, and then they started helping me under there, under, under the bed. Uh, I just kept saying it over and over again. Oh, God, please help us, please help us. Oh, God, please, please. And that's... That's exactly just what I was saying. And he did help us as well. He did. I uh, was coming home on embarkation leave and knew nothing that Evelyn was in the position she was. 
and uh, I left. We left London with a a blitz there, bo uh, air raid there, and the train running about 12, 15 mile an hour until we got out of London, and then about five hours after we arrived in Chesterfield, and you could see that uh, Chef was uh, getting a good hiding, and we re were there for about an hour, and eventually the train went very, very slowly round to Rotherham, and w that's where we alighted. Then I had to walk from Rotherham to Sheffield with a full kit, which wasn't very pleasant. And I remember walking down the wicker, and uh, all the trams were on fire. And I just didn't know which road to go. Water was about was six, nine inches deep. I didn't know which way to go to get home. And it's surprising where your strength come from to uh, to get round the corner to see if your house is still standing. That's a, a very, very funny experience. Uh, to, to get to the top of the street and hold your breath to see if you're standing. Fortunately, the windows and that were in, but uh, the house was all right. So I was very, very pleased and happy to be home. I thought, well, that's it. However, I, I went in, mother and father told me where Evelyn was. <laughs> I remember that. I don't, know where, I don't know where I got my strength from. I just dropped all my gear off and ran four miles to the hospital. Ran all the way. Of course, it was all over when I arrived, about six o'clock in the morning. But I went up to the ward where the baby was born, and uh, I think there's about 12 foot of floor space, and then no roof, no floor, and nothing. But if you said, how did I feel? I, the fear I'd experienced then, I don't know what I felt. But obviously when I did see my wife and son, Tears came. I'm sitting in an Anderson shelter. It's made out of corrugated mild steel. They were distributed free by the local authority. Unless, of course, the family income was more than five pounds a week, in which case they had to be paid for. Buried in people's gardens, they were proof to some extent against high explosive blast, but not against a direct hit. What they were proof against was the incendiary bomb. In the 1930s, Montague Norman, who was the governor of the Bank of England, persuaded City of London financiers to invest £450 million in German bonds. With the money, the Germans bought armaments from ordnance factories all over Britain. Some of these factories made incendiary bombs. Bombs like this were made by an engineering company in Islington. Made in Britain, bought by the Germans, and then dropped in their thousands during the Blitz on cities all over Britain, including Sheffield. German losses over Sheffield itself may have been negligible, but elsewhere their fortunes waned. This Messerschmitt 109E was not shot down over Sheffield, but nevertheless, it was exhibited like Roman spoils of war to a civilian population anxious to see with their own eyes how the Battle of Britain was being won. In spite of bombs and blitz, Christmas did come for a few children, like these kiddies at the St Anne's Rest Centre. There was at least cakes and a cup of tea. And for those who could still afford Christmas shopping, a few stores, operating on that famous business-as-usual principle, did open up. On the 7th of January 1941, after a miserable Christmas for many, bombed out and billeted around the city, there came what was for some a ray of cheer. King George VI and Queen Elizabeth visited Sheffield to see for themselves the devastation caused by the Hun bombers. The King and Queen were accompanied by Lord Harley, 
the Northeastern Commissioner for Civil Defense. In a diary of the day, he recalled how the Queen moved instinctively right into the middle of the crowd to hear at first hand how the citizens of Sheffield were coping with their ordeal. Lord Harlick was not alone in thinking that such visits did incalculable good. The people of Sheffield had shown that they could take it just like London could. There were more raids on Sheffield in January and February 1941, but there were thankfully few casualties. Then on March the 14th, parachute mines were dropped in the Southie Hill area. Eight people died and 60 were injured, many seriously. Initially designed for attacks against shipping, when used on land, the 1,000 kilogram parachute mine was devastating. The eerie flap and rattle of the parachute rigging was often the last sound many blitz victims heard. By this time, the defense of the city was passing to some extent into the hands of women. A nationally important experiment was conducted in Sheffield that gave the responsibility of the ubiquitous barrage balloon to members of the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. In 1941, it was declared that women perhaps could be used in order to do the job in the cities, which meant that men could be released for the more dangerous sites like the coast and overseas work. In fact, uh, Sheffield uh, was the first flight, uh, and I think it was in the Rotherham area, which was totally operated by women, no men on the site at all. And this proved to the officer commanding balloon command that it was possible. And from this beginning, the other flights throughout uh, the city and also throughout the UK became women operated rather than men. The balloon center here also came under number 33 balloon group. They were originally based up in Newcastle. But when it was quite obvious after about, I think it was somewhere the beginning of 41, that the operations were starting by the German Air Force against other targets, they were moved first to Hull because the ports were being attacked. And then eventually this number 33 balloon group were moved to Sheffield. And they were based at Parkhead House. And they controlled all the balloon operations from Derby to the Orkneys. The Luftwaffe returned three more times up to July 1942. And 20 more people were to die. But the air raids were no longer a serious threat to Sheffield's war effort. A Sheffield free from bombardment picked up the pieces and returned to its specialized role, producing manganese steel for everything from tin hats and bullets to gun barrels and bomb casings. Tanks, guns, armor plate, and even the steel reinforcement at D-Day's Mulberry Harbor and the tubes for Pluto were stamped made in Sheffield. On Monday, 16th of December, 1940, the day after Sheffield's Sunday Blitz, Churchill ordered the first RAF raid on German civilian targets. 134 RAF Wellingtons, many from bases in Yorkshire, bombed Mannheim with high explosives and incendiaries, just as the Luftwaffe had done to Sheffield. Having sown the wind, Hitler's Germany and its people were to reap the whirlwind. The death and destruction suffered by the people of Hamburg, Berlin, Cologne and Dresden put Sheffield's Blitz into perspective. But for those people who lost family and friends in Sheffield, the grief, mourning and sorrow was much the same. This is the entrance to one of the city's memorials to its Blitz dead. It's a mass grave for 134 people. The names of the 134 are carved in the stone. The memorial is looking a bit neglected and forgotten. A reflection perhaps of this generation's fading interest in the history of those dangerous, violent and dramatic days. God, the trouble that we 